think that's recording. Okay, so so welcome. So we've today you've got um, myself, Lisa Tricky. I'm the service manager for digital strategy and design at Dorset Council, and you've got Penny. Yes, my name's Penny Siddall, and I'm the program manager for digital skills and adoption. And we've just um, published our first digital vision for Dorset Council. So actually, it's quite timely to be able to to look back and think about our journey. And actually we get asked quite often you know how did you get going how did you build the brand so this is a, a nice opportunity to look back and reflect Penny and I can have a bit of a, a reminisce and think about um, what's happened over the over the last few years in Dorset so our, I'm, our, our digital vision I think is still quite unusual compared to a lot of other strategies that we've got out there because it's not just focused on technology we have um, five enabling strands for the strategy which include skills and inclusion, designing future services, business intelligence and data, leadership and culture and technology and infrastructure. So actually it's it, it's a, a kind of really holistic approach to becoming um, a, a digital dorset. And the other thing I think that's unusual is it's this kind of ecosystem that it recognises between becoming a digital council and being in a digital place and how those two things complement each other and, and come together. But actually the digital vision isn't the start of our journey. The start of our journey started, oh, a decade ago, didn't it, Penny? It did, yes. Um, so back in 2011, I think it's fair to say none of us were really that digitally aware. Certainly in our communities, Dorset people weren't shouting that loudly for better broadband, certainly not as loudly as they are now. Um, and, and the councils had IT departments, but no digital team. It wasn't mainstream in Dorset. But nonetheless, the investment case was made to government to invest in our connectivity. Uh, and so the Superfast Dorset project was limited, was, was launched. Um, and as we rolled out Superfast Broadband across the area, we told people how to access better broadband. We had a really strong communications team within, within Superfast Dorset. Uh, and that meant that the project was very visible from the beginning, both inside the council and in the wider community. Uh, and we recruited uh, media school placement students from Bournemouth University who joined us for a year and kept our ideas fresh. So nothing got too, too tired. Um, uh, and we kept uh, refreshing the super fast look. So uh, we started off with uh, a logo. Uh, and then we got some designs done by uh, a, a local designer. Uh, this is just one of loads that we had and all those windows opened up into um, mini designs that we could use on social media, which was fantastic. And then some sort of bigger uh, designs like that. That was the first iteration. Uh, and then we had this second version, which was more um, more urban, a bit, bit more of an urban, urban setting. Um, uh, then we had this lady uh, who was, we plastered all over our buses. Uh, we, I think, 20 buses had her um, flying down the side of it with words to talk, talking about um, super fast broadband coming to Dorset and it being the new thing and um, how to find out web, web links and so on. Uh, and most recently, just before the world well, 2019, we develop digital norm and digital norm had a bit more of a character than our previous designs. Uh, he had a story that went with him about how he took up a service and his family stopped moaning about him, um, moaning to him that the broadband was too too slow. And um and and everybody really took to digital norm, didn't they, Lisa? They, they, they did. They, everybody loved him and he became quite a recognizable character out there and um uh, and he helped us get the message out very very successfully um and so in that period uh, of adoption trying to encourage people to adopt a super fast service um we discovered along the way that around 21 percent of the adult population lacked basic digital skills um these people often older sometimes disabled usually on low incomes, 
i.e. the biggest users of our public services, didn't go online much, if at all. So we started a digital champion network. We worked alongside Skills and Learning, our adult education provider, um, and employed a part-time project officer who recruited some digital champions in the community and got them working. But we didn't really, we hadn't really proved the need for this. Our funding ran out and the project stalled. And we got some more funding. We got a new project officer in place. We got a new set of digital champions. But the new officer couldn't find the first set of digital champions, not, not all of them, because without support, some of them had stopped working. And that, of course, was disappointing at the time, but we learned something. We learned that volunteers need ongoing support and encouragement. What we needed was a proper project where they get consistent training and we could monitor what they were doing. We could know how many people they were seeing and what they were teaching them. Um, so that's what we needed. Uh, uh, but there were things going on inside the council at that time too, weren't there, Lisa? You were in you were in IT in those days, I think. I was. So well, you were busy talking about digital place effectively, or the start of digital place. I was asked to help make digital happen in the council. So obviously stickers and badges were involved in that. And we actually produced an animation articulating what we meant. And actually, Penny, this is where the first digital Dorset logo came along and the kind of bloom theme that we had at the time. We started, I think at this point, using the hashtag digital Dorset in earnest, probably around this time as well. I think one of the hardest things about um, about my role and, and the team's role is educating people on what digital actually is and so we've done you know we've learned really to just get on and work with people to show them rather than tell them about it you know and, and quite honestly my understanding of digital continues to evolve you know particularly after the pandemic with even more emphasis now on the human centered aspects so it's been a, a really interesting journey. So what we did to begin with in, within the council was we started out with this concept of a digital maturity curve and assessment, which was a really useful tool to start having a dialogue with teams and services to get them thinking about how digital they were and actually the things that they could start to consider and do to progress their digital journey. So that was um, something that we used to, to get some momentum around that. And actually working with Colin and Penny's team, we um, started to identify case studies to turn into stories to really demonstrate to people what we meant by all this digital stuff, helping to bring the different aspects of digital to life. I think, um, Penny, one of those was the Dorset Care Record, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. So they were launched back in March 2018. So this is an electronic repository which provides a consolidated view of information from health and social care systems across Dorset. Um, it's, it's one of the key programmes of the Dorset Integrated Care System uh, and it's a partnership which includes our acute community and mental health trusts, our GPs and of course our two local authorities. And do you know, Lisa, they've managed to train two and a half thousand health and social care professionals across the partnership to use DCR now. Uh, and these people are accessing around 20,000 patient records every month from across the county. Uh, among the most popular records accessed are pathology and radiology. Uh, and partners can access the DCR from their own system using a single click through, so a single sign on. Um, other feeds in the DCR come from partners from the demographic and GP information, alerts and referrals, discharge medications, allergies and clinical correspondence. So uh, they are really doing well now uh, and it's becoming a really important tool, I think, for, for the management of health and social care now. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's played a key role in the pandemic as well. I think we were able to give access to pharmacies early on. So I think, yeah, it's it's doing great strides which is fantastic. So one of the things we decided to do within within the council was work with FutureGov in around 2018 to help us learn and experience user-centred design. So that was really the start of our journey in terms of growing service design capacity and taking that approach to change. And so we worked on a couple of exemplar projects to think to, to understand really how this would be received by the organisation and the sorts of things that we needed to think about. We also started to do a lot of awareness raising. So, you know, 
in the digital team now. We love an event and one of my early favourites after lots of arm twisting with learning and development colleagues was uh, we use learning at work week to really generate some excitement about digital and some of the art of the possible. So we bought in children from a local school and they were actually teaching the adults. We had 3D printing, virtual reality, we did service design taster sessions and the response was really great and it did give a different kind of energy and experience that people weren't necessarily used to. And so we did something similar with members as well at the start of Dorset Council, where we had a big room, didn't we, Penny, one of the big committee rooms, and we had all sorts of suppliers and people telling um, and explaining a range of uh, digital aspects to, to councillors. So I guess because at this time in Dorset, the backdrop was local government reorganisation, we kind of, we knew that was coming. So for me, I guess some of the frustration was in terms of our broader, um, what we wanted to do more broadly in digital needed a bit more investment and we weren't able to get that at that time. But that meant instead we focused on people awareness and skills. And, and actually in hindsight, that was probably a better place to be. It's given us a really good foundation to build on. But I knew you, you couldn't just at that point think about digital council on its own we needed to think wider and create a much broader network in order for this stuff to really thrive and really that's when Penny and I and uh, a couple of other ladies got involved in creating um, a different type of network for Dorset so the, the digital network was born wasn't it Penny? Oh yeah, we had such good fun in the early days. It was just the five of us and we used to meet together in a room with some cake, um, just share what we were doing. Uh, so we were we, we five people who came from the different uh, legacy councils, the, the uh, original councils that then came together to make Dorset Council. Um, uh, and we, we just were fascinated every time, all of us were fascinated by what each of us were doing in that, in the digital area. Um, uh, and and we had such a nice time. And then we had the kind of light bulb moment of, well, maybe other people might like to be joining in with this conversation too. We Maybe we could share the fun. Uh, and so rather tentatively, we decided to have a, a network event. Uh, we thought we'd invite some people, bribe them with cake, uh, do some talks, give them lots of time for networking and see what happened. And what happened was that lots of people came and the network was born. And in fact, Digital Dorset moved from being this logo to being a movement, something people were part of. Um, so first of all, we invited colleagues from our own organisation. We got a bit braver and invited colleagues from partner organisations. So outside the local authorities, health, for example. And then we got a bit braver still and invited people from the private sector. So tech businesses, for example, which was a little bit scary because that's not how we normally work in, in the council. So this was this was really going going beyond what we'd done before. But it was really exciting. And every time the network grew, more people came uh, and there was more buzz around it. And do you know what, Penny, um, John Sloper's actually on the call, you know, and he's been involved in the network. So it's opened up new relationships for all of us, hasn't it? You know, it's been fantastic. And Absolutely. No, absolutely. Those people that we met through there have, have become firm partners and, and real supporters of what we're doing, which is which is fantastic. Um, actually, do you remember one of the first events that we had? Uh, and this was before local government reorganisation and Matt Prosser, who is now our chief executive, he was our chief executive designate at that time. And he had been the digital lead for SOLIS, which is the Society of Local Authority Chief Executives. And so we thought, oh, we'll get Matt along to talk to us. Uh, and so we grilled him on how he was <laughs> going to embed digital in the new organisation. Um, and uh, he already was doing that. He revealed to us that when he interviewed for his um, executive directors, his top team, he made them all do a digital test. He made them all do a vlog as part of the interview process because he wanted executive directors who would model digital behaviours. And that's what he got. And that came in really handy because last year we held this amazing thing, which we'll come on to talk about in more detail, 
um, the Festival of the Future. And as part of that, Matt and one of his directors, Aidan, uh, did this morning slot every day, um, apparently from their camper vans parked on some remote Dorset Heath. I think actually there was a bit of digital jiggery pokery that went on <laughs> and they had the backdrop and you know but anyway it appeared that they were they were broadcasting to to the nation to the world from their camper fans it was it was very cool and actually Robin Knowles from Digital Leaders dropped in one day didn't he and broadcast with them from the from the camper van for the festival so that was and amazing he absolutely did yes <laughs> yeah uh, you're so right, though. Matt's been Matt, Matt Pross has been a great support and actually leader in the digital space nationally as well, not just within our, our local council. And I didn't realise at the time, but he was involved in the um, MHCLG digital declaration. And Gavin Beckett's on on the call as well today. And uh, he, I remember having a phone call with him around the time talking about the work we were doing at that point in Dorset and I didn't I couldn't I didn't know that Matt was involved when I said you know we suggested that we become co-signatories of the declaration for the new council and you know it was such good timing because that meant we really got you know that cemented in as the new council was being formed so we got digital into the heart of the heart of the new council and and for me it's been a really helpful clear mandate for many conversations um, off the back of that which has been really good so I think probably related to that one of our core council values is about designing services around people's needs and so I think that's really important we've got that as a as a frame of reference and our behaviours complement our digital approaches so like working in the open and working in multidisciplinary teams fits really nicely with our behaviours which are collaboration recognition responsibility and respect so in the in the new Dorset council we have a, a corporate director Deb Smart absolutely focused on uh, digital and change and a dedicated service so we've now been brought together so the digital place team the digital team the change team and also the Dorset care record program so we've all, we'll, we've all come together under a single service and that's really enabled us to respond quickly last year in the pandemic because we had that that kind of good foundation to build on so during the pandemic like many other councils we had to design new services to respond to that such as our community shield which was our sort of local response library click and collect we had a skills agency so that we could move staff around based on the skills that they had we actually at that point decided to well no we actually fortuitously just before the pandemic we we decided to scale up our digital champion program internally so we worked with um, last year changing social and 365 tribe to really scale up our workforce digital champions and wow that was timely because they've been absolutely amazing during the pandemic supporting the organizations to just have a go with teams and and the microsoft tool set and to understand you know what works and not be afraid to, to have a go at these things i think we deployed 30 av1 avatars to children who couldn't attend school in those early days to enable them to participate in the classroom we procured a customer digital platform to, to work with PlaceCube. So lots of things happened last year during the pandemic to help us kind of, again, keep moving forward on our digital journey. But Penny, you, you had to pivot some of what you were doing, didn't you? We did. So to pick up the uh, story of digital inclusion in the community and, and that need to have some uh, a proper project, we had our proper project by by last year. Uh, we had it up and running uh, and very, very strong. Uh, we had around 70 volunteer digital champions. We knew exactly what they were doing uh, each month, who they were seeing, where they were working. Uh, and we had a programme of uh, communications to make sure that people knew where they could get help. And of course, most of them were working in libraries or other community centres. All that came to a um, shuddering stop. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, and we had to find a new way to help people and to maintain the interest of the digital champions uh, and give them something to do, which was was also part of our motivation, um, uh, because because they wanted to help, they wanted to be involved and 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 do something. So we set up uh, the digital hotline, which was a telephony service. People could ring in. Uh, there's a triage team. Uh, and they take some details and put them through to the most appropriate digital champion who's on uh, on that day uh, for some help. Uh, and that has been working really, really well. In fact, we've we've helped 
a thousand people. We've had over a thousand calls now um, to the hotline in the past year. So we've been able to give some help out into the community uh, where we couldn't do the face to face. We are now thankfully able to restart some of our face to face sessions. They're starting library by library, digital champion by digital champion. Uh, and it's uh, great to see that being able to be offered again to the public. Um, we also shifted our focus a little bit. We've been very focused on digital skills, but I think like a lot of organisations, we realised that skills wasn't the most important barrier to address at that particular time during the pandemic. Uh, and there were people who wanted to get online uh, for the first time, but who couldn't afford to. Uh, at, but by giving devices out, uh, that would go a long way. Of course, there's still the data, the connectivity costs, but that would go a long way to helping people, more people get online. But that uh, donation of a device had to go alongside support in, in most cases. So we used our digital champions to back up the devices, to, to back up the people uh, who were getting online for the first time. And that has been really rewarding. We've done some great case studies of people who've, who've been helped in that way. And it's made a a dramatic difference to their lives during during COVID. Um, we've also not been completely idle uh, on the sort of business case uh, front either. Uh, so we've uh, secured some funding uh, to do more connectivity out in the community. So building hub and spoke, full fibre connectivity uh, in rural areas. And most recently we got uh, 1.7 million from the Getting Building Fund uh, for this, which we're now beginning well uh, they're, they're, they're looking at the bids at the moment actually um so that work will, will start soon and another another program has just recently got underway a hub and spoke model so yes continue to build uh, and continue to support people uh, and all this work was cemented by an event that we held last summer uh called digital D dorset reloaded so the previous year um going back to 2019, we'd had an in-person event where about 100 people had come together at Kingston Morwood College uh, to start to talk about the vision. That was when we really began to look at what we all thought should be in the digital vision uh, and begin to structure it a little bit. And so Dorset Reloaded was a follow-up to that. That was This was digital, um, a virtual event last summer uh, and we were able to update our original image uh, we have a very talented um <laughs> Kirsten, <laughs> um, Alex May. <laughs> artist, yes uh, in in in, a, in our team or in one of Lisa's teams uh, and uh, he produced this amazing image of what we felt were the, the key areas um uh, and what we wanted to do and um so I also uh, mentioned Festival of the Future. Um, that was another event last year. That was in the autumn, uh, and that was that was massive, uh, Lisa, wasn't it? It was. It was, and it was. It was really intended to again get people excited about digital, raise awareness. But in the context of the pandemic, we know that digital has obviously got a key role in helping with our recovery. So getting people to think about careers in digital. So yes, it was it was an epic event put together in five weeks, if I recall, Penny. <laughs> yeah, it was very, very quick. Um, yeah. And we so we had about 30, I think 60 sessions over three days and actually it was it was really fun and we pulled in all sorts of people to be part of that but one of the other things I'm really excited about actually is working with the, the NHS locally on our digital academy and one of our first um, our first focus in in that space has been on working with Adaptive Digital to develop our initial cohort of quantum leaders. So this is really thinking about the people aspects of transformation and how we can develop these quantum leaders to help be credible disruptors and have the right mindsets for a modern organisation and to be able to lead change and so we're doing that across the system with the NHS so uh, I'm really it's, it's been their second uh, session today Penny so I'm looking forward to, to hearing how that's gone but I think what's um 
been useful about our approach over the years and not always having money necessarily available to us we've actually just had to try things and experiment at, at, a, at a small scale but that's enabled us now to really scale up with confidence and that's why we've been doing recruitment recently if, if people have seen that we're trying to really then scale up some of the work that we've been doing and I think and plenty particularly around inclusion and, and the place work isn't it yeah absolutely uh no it has been uh it has been an exciting um uh an exciting time and great to be able to uh recruit some more people um so that has brought us to the end of our story i think lisa hasn't it i thought you were going to talk about 5g <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, well, um, we we've uh, we have also got the five G program. Uh, that has been that that has been a massive thing. In fact, uh, during the the last year, we've been able to um, get that moving, and that's doing uh, these te test bed and trials in a number of different areas, looking at the coast, um, safety along the coast, looking at agritech. Uh, looking at uh, our innovation park uh, and the uh, work that we've been doing with the battle lab and with the MOD there. Um, so that is is hurling us forward um, in terms of being right at the forefront of, of trialling digital applications. Um, we, we've always known that, that connectivity and skills underpin everything but sitting on top are the use cases and, and 5G is, is part of that. Uh, and we're looking forward to uh, the, the 5G team uh, are, do a lot of publicity around it. Um, uh, and uh, there's a lot to be seen. You, you, you can find a lot online already. And that will continue right through to the end of the programme next year, um, showing exactly what they're doing there. Yeah. I mean, We've still got lots of work to do, haven't we, in the organisation to really, you know, bring our digital vision fully to to life. And I think I'll be I'll be happy when we get to the point where we stop talking about digital because I know that we've mainstreamed it then, and it's just how we think and operate, and it's part of our DNA. So, um, you know, we're just on this journey, and really, it, it's still very much early days for us. And I think now is probably an opportunity. If anybody did want to ask any questions, we're more than happy to, to take any. You can feel free to pop something in the chat or pop your hand up. As someone who lives and works over the border and about to go through the unitary journey, I'd like to say, oh, oh, oh thank you. I thought it was going to be a question there, but um, <laughs> thanks, Kat. That's great. Um, Anybody have any questions or want to? Yes. How did you get engagement from the digital nope. champions we've got? Uh, yeah. Um, so the internal, uh, the external digital champions, it wasn't hard at all. You know, people were lining up. So what what do we know about Dorset? It's a place that everybody goes to retire, right? Mm. Um, I mean, there's a little bit more to it than that. But, you know, there is some truth in that. There are a lot of retired professionals who have come from you know big professional jobs uh and and they can see the need to get people online so actually finding people to be digital champions has been remarkably easy most of our digital champions are retired it professionals and so they their their tech skills are are fantastic and actually lots of them want an excuse to keep up with their tech skills and in fact will tell us that one of the reasons they do it is because they get sometimes get asked questions that they can't answer, uh, and so it gives them a chance to to keep ahead, keep up with with things. So, um, not difficult at all in our area, fortunately. Um, Penny, there's a question about rural communities who can't get high speed broadband. I know there's work that we're doing again. It kind of does touch on five G and the fibre work that we're doing, doesn't it? In terms of trying to get to those hard to reach areas. Yes, yeah, so right at the moment, the DCMS, um, the Department for Digital Media, Culture and Sport, 
um, has uh, uh, an opportunity for people to um, give them their views. It's call call for evidence uh, on that exactly that how to get to, how to reach those hard to reach areas uh, and we've put in quite a c considerable and, and well thought through what we hope um submission to that uh, and we've asked our parishes and town councils to support us and our partners to support us so i think they'll be putting in submissions too um so so there are, there's work that we're doing in terms of uh, continuing to work with open reach uh, to finish a contract, um, a, a legacy contract. There's new this new work, this new funding that I was talking about, providing the hub and, hub and spoke model, which is building out to, um, for example, a library in a town or a village or a school. Um, uh, and actually, we're we're looking at going to even more remote places that don't have uh, schools or libraries as well. Um, so there's the hub and spoke work that that we're paying for. Uh, then there are vouchers. There are there's a government voucher scheme. Um, where people can uh, get vouchers, work together with their neighbours and, and get a, get vouchers to get bring connectivity to them. And in fact, we've put in a million pounds, Dorset Council has put in a million pounds as top up for that. Um, so there's a bit more money, you can get a bit more money uh, per household, which enables more remote places to get connected. Um, uh, and ultimately, then there's the universal service obligation on open reach to provide anybody with under 10 megabits per second with uh, a workable service. So there are a number of things in place, but then there's this call for evidence because it's still not quite t getting everywhere. So that's um, that will hopefully be able to influence. We'll be, and we work with our MPs very closely. For example, Chris Loder came to our program board yesterday. Um, he's the West Dorset MP. So we work through them as well to influence government um, to put in place things that will work for Dorset. I'm just uh, I was just replying to some of the chats. There's some questions about our um, digital maturity assessment. So we have we have the curve and it's in the digital vision. So I will paste the link into that. And we did a light touch review as part of just following the pandemic to assess kind of where we were. So the link is in there. And, I, and there is an article on Digital Leaders blog about the, the approach that we took. So um, that is available as well. Okay, uh, Mike Watson came in, Penny, and said, "We've got to say all the digital champions are show-offs." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we know they do that. fantastic job. Aren't they? They're absolutely brilliant. Um, what else? Um, Caroline, Caroline, you asked about what methods of evaluation have you done to establish take-up? Is that take-up of broadband or um, something else? Did you want to to speak or pop in the chat? Yes. Um, thank you, Lisa. It, it was um, the take up um, right at the beginning. I mean, you gave a statistic of um, something like 21% um, oh. were struggling with, oh, I forget what you said. Yeah, um, the distribution. Yes. Did, yeah. yeah. So how did you get to that figure? How did, how did you know? How did you know? <laughs> That's so, a very good question. <laughs> it is a very good question. It's a very good question. So, um, Back then, what we did was we used um, the national figure, uh, and that has been the national figure for a very long time. Um, it doesn't seem to shift very much at all. Uh, but over the period that we've been working, more sophisticated methods of measuring um, this, and it depends exactly what you're measuring. Are you measuring um, basic digital skills, which is what the what it used to be, or essential digital skills, which is a slightly different measure. Um, uh, then there's so so there are different things that you're a little bit. We've got a little bit more sophisticated and been able to measure a bit better in Dorset using our resident survey. Uh, but again, that was a little bit difficult to interpret because um, because last well this year. Um, no, last year, at the end of last year, it was published at the beginning of this year, but the survey was done at the end of last year. It was um, it was all done digitally. So obviously it was it was uh, uh, not not very rep representative, but we have done some work to try and understand from the evidence that we did have from the resident survey, what we could tell from that. Um, there is also some, uh, so Ofcom do, um, 
ask a whole lot of questions around digital and use of digital, which has been analysed by a guy called Simeon Yates. Um, he's, a, he's an academic uh, and he um, he's looked at the Ofcom data and worked out what it means and has, has categorised people's ability to use digital in a slightly different way. Uh, and that, I think, is the most accurate and and sophisticated measure at the moment av available. Um, and he's done a national measure, and that actually suggests that it's it's rather higher than than twenty one percent. we We reckon in Dorset eleven percent are offline completely, and uh, around twenty percent on top of that lack digital skills, so giving about thirty one percent. And he would put the figure at around forty. 42% of people who don't have good enough digital skills. Um, so it very much depends on. Um, so I'm going to speak to him. Uh, I'm speaking to him in the next week or two to see if he can analyze the Ofcom data in relation to Dorset specifically um, to get us a Dorset figure. So it slightly depends on what you ask, what, what questions you ask, and how you look at the data. But we're, we, we look at it in a number of ways. Thank you. Thank that's, that's good. Uh, Caroline, then. Um, Penny touched on the on the residence survey there, and actually last year we did put in a number of digital type questions for residents, also to help us with our customer platform work, understanding you know when people what people were using, when they were prepared to use it, and that was really interesting as well because uh, we had about. Um, 84% of people that replied and said they were happy to do their banking and shopping online, but only 24% of them were confident in using our online services. So that's really helped us understand that the work that we need to do in terms of comms and engagement and making our online services really great to use and easy to use as well. So surveys are really helpful from that perspective. We've also um, just put out for people to get involved in testing our, our new website we had a massive response from from residents that wanted to get involved testing that so that's been fantastic as well so really trying to work with people to help us along our journey I'm just um, conscious of ooh, time now we're meant to be finishing it at quarter two that I think so. Um, <laughs> there, is, there is one question here, which I, I don't think we can answer, but I think we need to just say that we can't answer it, which is what challenges did you encounter sharing data between council, health and private sector organisations? So I think you're talking about Dorset Care Record, which I talked about briefly. Um, mm -hmm. We uh, didn't I can pick that up, Penny. We did an awful lot of work at the time. We did lots and lots of workshops mm. with the different organisations and services. We developed a Dorset information sharing charter that we've referred to as the DISC, and we have underpinning what we call PISA's personal information sharing agreements that we use. So there was a lot of um, kind of frameworks put in place and then actual education and training and awareness to do that now you know that I'm not saying there aren't still some challenges you know that there still are particularly in, in children's services with some of their data so um, but we, we've done quite well and we've got social care data with health data and that's that's really helped um, helped with delivering that integrated care system agenda Wonderful. Well, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us today. It's been lovely to have you here. And um, if, yeah, if ever you wanted to, to follow up on anything, do feel free to get in touch with Penny and I. We're both on LinkedIn, on Twitter and, uh, you know, always welcome new connections and, and, and following other people. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Yes, thank you very much for joining us today. I feel like we need some music now to you, actually, as everybody. <laughs> oh, lovely. Thank you, everybody. Oh, thank you.